How's it going everybody? My name is Jim and welcome to Restoration Projects. Today's video we're going to be doing a repower and tune-up of this early 1940s Delta 14 inch bandsaw. What we're going to be doing is pulling off this newer motor and putting on a time period specific motor that was what you would get with this bandsaw when it rolled off the production line. For the starter and stop switch on it, we're going to be installing a push-pull rod, which is also what they used back in the 40s with these old saws. Right there you can see the sticker that had the patents that were applicable to this saw when it was first made. These 14-inch bandsaws were first produced in 1934, and Delta started putting serial numbers on these saws in about 1941. So this is a probably early 1942-43 Judging by that serial number there, it's a pretty low number, and from what I could find online, that's the area I think it is. Delta 14-inch bandsaw is widely regarded as one of the best bandsaws you can get for your shop. This reputation exists because of the design, build quality, and capability of these saws. They are a two-piece cast iron design, with a cast iron base and a cast iron arm that holds the upper pulley. There is also an optional riser block kit that you can get for these saws, which is a spacer block that goes in between the arm and the base that allows you to increase your re-saw capacity from 6 inches to 12 inches. This is the motor that we're going to be adding to the saw. It is a delta motor and from what I can tell based off the stickers is it's probably from the mid 40s to maybe early 50s. There's no way to really date this as there's no serial number on these motors. And this motor looks kind of rough. Uh, but realistically all it needs is a paint job because the motor spins freely. Um, if you can see just off to the left of my hand there, there are two screws right above the shaft on either end and that is where you can add grease to these things. And a lot of times if these are stiff, like hard to turn, if you take them apart and just clean out the old grease, which will probably be the consistency of candle wax, you can add new grease and they will run just fine. A little bit of history about Delta. It was started by a gentleman named Herbert Taus, which I'm probably mispronouncing this uh, pronunciation of that last name, so I do apologize. But Herbert was born in Berlin, Germany in February of 1896 and immigrated to the U.S. in 1914. He started the Delta Specialty Company in a one-car garage in 1919 at 969 Lewis Avenue on Milwaukee's northwest side. It was originally called the Delta Specialty Company until the early 30s. They first started making small tools for the home shop and later expanded into light industrial machinery. In 1923, Touts invented the Delta's first breakthrough product, the American Boy Scroll Saw. Although it was built for hand operated use in 8 inch and 12 inch sizes, the tool paved the way for future electric power stool, uh, scroll saws. As the country reached the height of the depression, Talos and his Delta machinery continued to forge ahead with new products. By the mid-70s, countless companies were manufacturing the saws Touts had invented. Herbert Touts retired in Denver, Colorado, where he died July of 1975, at the age of 97. His body was cremated, and the ashes are in an urn that has the writing, Inventor of Delta Power Tools, etched onto it. That's a pretty awesome history. And we have that man to thank for a lot of the tools we have today. You can still see his design in a lot of tools that are manufactured by other companies, even to this day. A lot of these are import designs or companies, but they still have that same Delta style to them if you look closely. So back to the restoration on this uh, motor here. I've painted it and I've tried to get it to as close of a uh, color that would have been a factory original as possible. One question I do get asked a lot on this channel is why I prefer to use rattle can paint instead of using a professional spray gun and spray booth. And the answer to that is a two-fold answer. I work out of a two-car garage and I just don't have the space for a big enough air compressor and a paint booth. And secondly, I use all the tools I restore. I love getting everything to as original pristine of condition as I can, but all these tools do get used and in a the shop they will get scratched, dinged, and dented. And you will occasionally need to touch up the paint from time to time. And I find it to be a lot easier to have a can of spray paint laying around to do that touch up rather than having to go and 
mix a whole uh, container of paint and put into a spray gun. So right there, that is the motor painted up. And like I said, this is a quick, just keep it from corroding job. Um, I didn't do a full tear down on it. It didn't need it. Um, this is just to make it look time period specific and keep it clean and rust free. I took the uh, pulley there off of the old motor and I'm just attaching it on to this one and we're going to get ready to install this. So when it comes to um, working on machines, they have an electric overhead hoist which I find to be very very beneficial and a back saver. And disclaimer, anytime you're uh, lifting loads overhead, make sure that one, the equipment's rated for it, and two, never stand underneath the load and never have any part of your body, fingers, toes, anything underneath that load in case it falls. Um, always plan on things failing and you'll be okay in life. So I just add a uh, board on top of two uh, sawhorses here and I'm going to lower the saw back down on it, but I'm not going to take the tension off of the hoist cable. I want to keep that tension taut so if one of those legs does fall off that table there that it is going to be safe and it's not going to fall off and tip over on me. Right here uh, I pulled off the old motor and I did not have the video uh, camera rolling when I did that but I did have to make a different spacer for this and I just took it over to the milling machine and milled out the channels for the bolts to go into. and. You might be wondering why I'm using uh, wood under there to lift that motor up. And the simple answer is, well, that's how I got it. It was that way when I bought the machine. It had a piece of wood underneath the motor. And I think the reason for that, realistically, is people probably didn't have the right size belt for these um, tools back in the day when they bought them. They just had a belt that was maybe two inches too short. And it's cheaper to grab a piece of scrap wood and uses a spacer between the motor and the base than it is to go buy a new belt. That's my assumption. I don't know if that's correct or not, but in that case, that's what I did here. I didn't want to go out and buy a new belt, and adding a piece of wood under there, it makes it look retro. Um, I see a ton of these machines with these pieces of wood under there, and yeah, I, that's my assumption, is just because people didn't have their right size belt. So I'm bolting it down right there, I'm using an impact driver with a right angle adapter to uh, tighten down the uh, bolts and there you can see, I'm just going there, zip everything down, get it nice and snug and then we'll be uh, ready to wire it up. One thing that I am a very big proponent of on this channel when you're restoring old machinery is to go through the electrical and make sure that the cord has not deteriorated. I restore a lot of these machines and over time the sheathing that covers electrical cords will disintegrate and cause cracking, exposing the bare wires which can cause a fire or electrocution. If you're not comfortable doing electrical on your own, uh, taking it to a machine shop or to an electrician, they're, these are pretty simple machines, at least the single phase ones, to wire up and it shouldn't be that much to have somebody professionally do it for you. If you feel comfortable doing it yourself, um, there's a lot of videos out there on the internet that will do a lot better job than I will explaining how to wire these up. I don't get into too much detail on how I wire them up because in case I'm incorrect on what I'm doing, I don't want to give people wrong information. Right here I am installing the push rod that is used to turn the machine on and off. It is just a rod that goes down to a switch and when you lift up on it, it turns the machine on and when you push down on it, it turns the machine off. It is made out of a piece of wire that's designed to hold up insulation in between rafters or joists. It's a very uh, non-bendable wire, so add a little bit of heat, get in the position that you need it in, and it will hold that position. The ones from Delta were a little bit thicker. This is thinner, but it does the same job that uh, the ones from the factory would do. Here I'm taking the saw down off of the sawhorses. And one thing to note is when I've been repairing machines like this and I've had it up elevated off the ground, I've occasionally set tools on the machine's work table. So you can see where I have my hand there, I'll set a screwdriver up there, and I forget about it. And when I go to lower the saw down, it tips the saw and that screwdriver goes flying off. And if I happen to be standing in the direction of that screwdriver, that's going to be a bad day for me. Remember, we don't want our hobbies to cause us injury, so be safe, double check your surroundings before you do anything like that where you're lifting. 
This part of the video, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be tuning up the saw. So what I mean by tuning up, that means put in new thrust uh, bearings. So these bearings, there's two of them, one on the bottom and one on the top side, that keep the blade from being pushed based essentially off of the wheels. So you're going to see right here, I'm taking off the blade guard, and then I'm going to replace this bearing here. So you can leave the blade on to do this. Um, if you're careful, just don't cut yourself and just take a screw out and this bearing comes off. This bearing is kind of a sacrificial item. They're very cheap and they're a ball bearing. So ball bearings aren't designed to be side loaded, which this one is being, that's the design of this. And as it's being side loaded and it's exposed to a lot of sawdust, it will eventually fail. They usually fill up with uh, dust and debris and you'll see saw marks on them too as they fail. So check them often and if they don't spin freely, replace them. You can buy them in bulk, they're relatively cheap and it's a, uh, it just makes your saw run better and it'll make your blades last longer. Another thing that I'm going to be replacing right here is the blocks that hold the blade from moving side to side originally had bolts in them and I'm putting set screws back in them because that's what came from the factory. Anytime I'm restoring a machine, I like to get it as time period specific as possible, meaning I want it to look the way it would have when it rolled off the factory line. So a bolt would work just fine for holding those blocks into place, but I like the aesthetics of the set screws because that's what it came with from the factory. And it's those little changes that you can make to these machines to try to keep them as time period specific as possible. Right here we're going to take the uh, saw blade off, so it just makes a 90 degree turn and we pull it out of the slot and it's in the table. Now we need to remove the table to be able to access the um, blade guides on the bottom. So that's done by taking off there's two hand washer or hand, hand screws, hand nuts I should say, that are underneath the table and then you can lift the table directly off. There's usually quite a bit of sawdust that's built up on the uh, bottom guides there so it's always good to go over with a vacuum cleaner, just clean it up. The uh, clean machinery usually runs better. So quick vacuum and then we will get a better close up of the uh, lower blade guide here. Here you can see the lower blade guide and the two trunnions that support the table. So what we're going to do first is we're going to remove these screws here and the screws are what adjust the blade guide and the thrust bearing. So I'm just getting this uh, stuff pulled apart here and then I'm going to try to give you a close up so you can see what exactly I'm doing. And I know I have this kind of going fast. If you look up these uh, schematics online there should be uh, pretty detailed ones on how to take these things apart. But essentially you just have a rod that uh, travels on the top there that has the bearing on it and that bearing rolls up against the shoulder and then you have a piece of tubing that clamps that bearing up to that shoulder and then that whole assembly will side slide side to side and that's what gives you that thrust uh, bearing capability right there. So when I go to reinstall this uh, new bearing you should be able to see it better. So first off we got to use a, a uh, aluminum uh, punch there that way I don't mar up the threads and we're going to tap off the bearing because it's kind of stuck on there as you can see and there it comes off. I know that was really fast but it'll make sense when I put the new one on. First things we need to do though is get in there and clean it up so uh, just a brush, give everything a quick wipe down, make sure stuff moves freely. These things are stiff when they move side to side, the blade guides, um, and please do not spray any oil or put any sort of lubricant down there because what will happen is the first time that you run that saw, all that dust that falls down there will be attracted to that oil and then it will stick on there making it impossible to move that blade guide side to side. So I know that happened really fast there but you can see I put the uh, bearing on and then put the two pieces back together. And then we're going to throw a nut on here and then this is going to allow us to put our uh, bolt back in and reassemble this whole thing. This probably looks a little complicated from this video but when you see these in person they're actually a pretty ingenious design and uh, it's a pretty simple design too. So uh, it just the video doesn't do it justice. So right here I'm just reassembling everything, cleaning everything with a brush, just make sure we get all the dust off because if you keep your stuff clean, then it will work better. So right there I'm just putting these uh, lock collars back on, they have a little grub screw in there, and that's what keeps the threaded rod from walking all the way out. 
And now that I have those things both uh, reinstalled there, I'm going to try to pull that uh, blade guard closer to the original position so when I put the blade in, I don't have to move it as much. And when you see these things in person, they're kind of cool because they allow the uh, blade guides to move independently of the thrust washer. Right here we're installing the table, so just you gotta make sure the two bolts go in the right holes there, and then you have the uh, nut handles that have a spring and a washer on them, and just make sure that you put it, it goes washer, spring, and then the nut. We're gonna tighten those on there, and this uh, saw can cut up to a 45 degree angle as you tip the uh, table to the front, and there is a leveling nut, we'll call it, on the back that holds the saw when you put the table back down, holds it right at 90 degrees or whatever you set that nut at. So a little bit further in this video, we're going to talk about how to make sure that table is at perfect 90 degree angle to the blade. Right here, I'm just putting the saw blade on. And what I'm about to demonstrate is how I get these uh, blades um, lined up to the um, blade guides. So what I mean by that is I'm going to loosen up all the grub screws right there. <clears throat> and then I want to get that uh, those blocks pulled out away from the blade so they're not deflecting it forward or backwards. Same thing on the bottom. So you want to have those blocks basically pulled away from the blade, spin the blade by hand a couple times. That way you make sure that's tracking right where it wants to on the uh, tire. Ideally you want the teeth, the gullet of the teeth on these blades to be right at the middle of the tire. And once everything's lined up like that, then I take the blocks and then you're going to take them and push them just to where they barely touch the blade and then tighten them down. The reason for you, you don't want them uh, clamping the blade because all that will do is bind up and cause a lot of heat. They want there to be free play between the blade and the blocks. Um, the blocks are designed so if you start uh, twisting the blade, it'll try to hold it in place. These smaller blades like this, I believe this is like a quarter inch blade here. Um, they're kind of hard to get those uh, blade guides to really hold it, so you just got to be careful. You don't want the teeth to actually be inside of the blade guides. So up here on the top section, this will be a little bit better. So that's what it's supposed to look like. You're just supposed to tap the blocks in to where they just touch, spin the blade, and then tighten them down. And then there is a uh, thrust or thrust bearing. Excuse me. You can see I'm just walking it up just until it barely makes contact. You just want to hear it just, you know, you're listening for a sound, not seeing it actually spin. Because when that machine is running, you don't want that bearing moving until you put a lateral force on it from cutting in with a piece of wood. <clears throat> right here you can see I just put up the first cold block, or first block, these are ceramic blocks. Cold block is a, technically a, I believe a trademark name. So the blade guide blocks here, I push the first one up. Now I'm tightening it down, and I'm going to take this uh, other one in from the bottom side and tighten that down as well. When Delta first made these saws, they actually used steel blocks for the uh, blade guides, and I have a couple of them floating around my shop, and they've actually been cut out, so they're not uh, perfectly 90 degree angles anymore. They are, uh, you've seen where the blade is actually dug into it and actually eroded out some of the steel, so kind of impressive. Right here I'm going to show how to uh, make that make sure that that blade is at perfect 90 degree angle to the table. So first thing, we want to clean off the table of any residue, any sawdust, anything that's going to you know, take our measurements off. Then I want to use a precision square, and what I'm doing is I'm just putting that square right up that blade, and I'm looking for any light uh, differences in width from the top to the bottom. And that will tell me if I need to adjust my table for backwards. Now this one is pretty much dead accurate. One thing I want to demonstrate here though, it's probably not showing up very well in this video, but you can see that there's the same distance between the blade and the measure and the square at the top as it is the bottom. One thing I want to show though is when you throw in that throat plate right there, so this is a little aluminum disc, it will actually throw off your measurements. So you always want to do these type of measurements without that throat plate in there because now if you see there's a little bit of a gap at the top. It's not much, it's only maybe a couple thousandths, but if you're trying to do precision woodworking, having this thing set up as precise as possible and taking the time to get this thing dialed in will give you the best results possible that this saw can produce. 
these people, when they built these saws back in the 40s and 30s, they put a lot of time in these machines, making them as accurate as possible. And if we just spend a little bit of time in our own shops when we're setting these things up, we can get amazing results from these machines 80 years later. Right here, I'm installing the blade guide, or sorry, blade guard. Uh, this is just to keep your fingers and any part of your body from hitting that blade as it's spinning. That just tightened on there with two screws. And then we're going to, I think that's going to be it for this. Um, normally I would uh, replace the tires on this, the, so they're rubber or um, polyurethane tires that go on the top and bottom wheel. These ones are actually in really good condition, so I didn't see the need to replace them just to replace them. I mean, they work just fine for this application. Alright, we are done with the tune-up and repower of this machine. and. Uh, one thing I wasn't able to capture on camera is I made a guard for the motor for the shaft that sticks out on the side where you'd be working when you're uh, operating this machine. It's just a piece of uh, tubing that I used a boring bar on a lathe to bore it out until it would make a nice snug fit over the end of the motor there and I welded a cap on it. You don't want loose clothing uh, near spinning machinery. Uh, I did not paint this machine as I did not want to take away from the history of it. Um, people like myself do destroy history by quote rebuilding those machines in our garage and um, there's something to be said about having our original machine even if it does have some scrapes in the paint um, it's kind of cool seeing the actual what it looked like from the factory even if it is faded uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video hopefully this answered a little bit of questions about tuning up a saw and if you got something out of this video please smash that subscribe button once again thank you guys for joining me with this and have a wonderful day